It's the Prison News Podcast on Spreaker. Greetings and welcome to the broadcast. I'm your host. First up, Benjamin Davis, founder of white supremacist 211 Crew, found dead in prison. Benjamin Davis's death is currently being viewed as a suicide, said Colorado Department of Correction spokesman Mark Fairbarn, who declined to detail when or even where Davis was found. Now, the 211 crew, you may remember, captured national headlines after one of their guys killed the Department of Corrections director, whose name was Tom Clements. That was back in March of 2013. They got a guy named Ebo, and he was disguised as a pizza delivery man, and he gunned down Clements in front of his home in Monument, Colorado. Now, the murder of the Colorado Department of Corrections director was ordered by a hierarchy of the 211 crew, a Texas Ranger report on the case concluded. Now, here's how this thing happened. Davis was 42 years old back in 1995. He was in a Colorado prison cell. He was uh, attacked by a group of black detainees, and they broke his jaw, according to court records. And his dad said, Benjamin's jaw, his jaw right here, was so badly broken, he had to hold it up with his hands. His father, Israel Davis, wrote to a judge in 2007, Two black inmates were beating him up and attempting to throw him over over the railing when another black inmate who Benjamin had known on the street ran up and saved him, the senior Davis wrote. Otherwise, he would have been killed. As a result, Davis and several other white prisoners devised a plan to protect themselves, according to Israel Davis. Now, what they did, they scrawled the numbers 211-GANG with soap on multiple cells throughout the facility and made people think they were a bigger gang than they really were and ultimately started a major white supremacist gang. Next up, ABI baggage handler to spend 18 months in prison for stealing guns out of airport luggage. A baggage handler at the Austin, Texas International Airport will spend 18 months in prison for stealing guns from the checked luggage. Now, folks, it seems like they may have sanitized this article. I can't find anywhere about what was the name of the airline in Texas where he was stealing these guns on this one-year crime spree. Anyway, I returned to text. Jaquan Johnson, uh, a 26-year-old black, was sentenced in federal court Friday morning. In June, Johnson pleaded guilty to one count of theft from an interstate shipment and one of possession of a stolen firearm. Now, Johnson admitted that he stole several handguns. He only got charged with one for whatever reason. He stole seven handguns from passengers' bags at the airport all the way from November 2016, clear up through February 2017. Now, police said the first complaint came in when a traveler's gun was missing. Officers got search warrants for Johnson's home after months of watching employee card swipes. Now, Johnson underwent and passed an airport background check and had no prior criminal history. Next, two could face life in prison after prison drone drop. Now, three Detroit residents were arraigned Friday in the Iona County District Court. They could face felony charges with penalties ranging from seven and a half years to life. That's right, you heard it, life. These guys could get life for using a drone to smuggle in contraband into a state prison. Patrick Seaton, Daryl Marshall, and Jonathan L. Roundtree all face fellow uh, felony smuggling charges after the Iona County prosecutor alleged they plotted to drop three cell phones and some marijuana into a nearby state prison on Thursday. They're the first three people in Michigan to be arrested for using a drone to sneak contraband into an actual state prison. It's been tried before, apparently. They never caught the guys. All three face the same felony charges of using a drone uh, to drop this stuff off in violations. However, one of these guys, because he's a, a has a prior, what they call a prior, could end up doing life in prison for this thing. Uh, all three pleaded not guilty and face a preliminary exam in September. Roundtree is the one that could face up to life in prison because of past convictions for being involved with that drone. Now, speaking of convictions, this one, folks... This is CNN Tech. It says, punishment for using Facebook in prison? Answer, solitary confinement. Now, this is some harsh stuff here. A report Thursday by Electronic Frontier Foundation researcher David Mass shows that South Carolina's Department of Corrections considers creating or even assisting with a social network site while you're in prison 
an offense akin to a committing a violent crime against a prisoner or even an officer. That's right. Prisoners found to post on Facebook and South Carolina system can face losing privileges such as their visitation rights, their prison telephone access, and many receive solitary confinement sentences. State documents show. Folks, that's what's going on right now. Now, the punishments are doled out separately for each day that the inmate posts on social networking, such as Facebook or Twitter. That means posting once on Monday and once again on Wednesday counts as two individual violations. But posting 50 times in one single day only counts as one violation. Ain't it great the way they've got this figured out? Over the past three years, 432 disciplinary cases have been brought against uh, South Carolina inmates for using social networks. Of those disciplined prisoners, 40 receive more than two years in solitary confinement. Now, please listen. This next one's not a misprint. And 16 were sentenced to more than a decade alone in a cell. Now, one inmate named Taheem Henry received a 37-year solitary confinement sentence for posting on Facebook 38 times. He also ended up losing 74 years worth of phone and visitation rights. Folks, if you haven't been here before at Prison News, this sounds like a hoax. And it actually sounds like a hoax to me, but I'm reading it right on this morning's news on called money.cnn.com. And I'm trying to verify it on some other sources to try to make this broadcast for you. Wow, that's a lot of time for doing a post. Now, uh, just last week, the state began to roll back its use of solitary confinement as punishment for social media use. So they're talking about somebody saying, hey, can we put a cap on this or something? It tends to, you know, so some of the guys are perhaps could stir up trouble, and maybe others aren't. Now, the Facebook also allows law enforcement officers to issue an inmate account takedown request, preventing inmates from having even having a social media presence, and it even disallows their friends or their mother from posting on their behalf. They're acting like a censor. They don't have to do this to us, EFF researcher David Moss told CNNMoney.com. Next. Texas, the prison rape capital of the U.S. Folks, if you have little ones in there or your stomach's not ready for this, please just pass it by. Just hit the advanced thing. A couple go to the next article. Now, as a prison nurse, Dominique Helgado had access to prescription medicine, a highly coveted commodity among the inmates at Clements Unit in Texas, the state prison where Hildago worked. He tried to use that access to get what he wanted, sex with Matthew, a prisoner at the facility. Now, Matthew reported Hildago's advances to the prison staff, and officers wired him with a recording recording device and told him he had to prove it. Now, the audio was obtained by the Marshall Project. Hildago can be heard handing Matthew a bufofen pill, a type of antidepressant, asking him to perform oral sex on him in exchange. This is the best time, said Hildago, but Matthew demurred, saying, he'll come back soon. Let me just mess around with you, Hildago insisted. Then he pulled down Matthew's pants. In Texas, sexual contact between staff and inmates is a felony, punishable by up to two years in prison. However, as you'll see as we continue this article, that that seldom happens. Anyway, Hildago and others avoided a prison sentence, and he pled guilty in exchange for a $500 fine and a little probation. So that was one case. Now, This deal with Hildago, it says it's typical in Texas, and it illustrates how rare it is for prison staff who are abusive and even sexual predators to be imprisoned for sexually abusing people in their charge. Now, since 2000, the state's prison system inspector general has referred nearly 400 cases of staff sex crimes against inmates to prosecutors. Guess how many of them get prosecuted? Well, I'll allow you to do the research for yourself on Google or YouTube or wherever you want to look it up. Now, of 126 prison workers, these are mostly correctional officers convicted of sexual misconduct, just nine were sentenced to serve time, and the rest get off pretty much scot-free. Now, Clements Unit is one of the reasons that Texas leads the nation in prison sex abuse. Now, this is a federal survey, by the way, of inmates. This isn't some pressure group. Texas has had more facilities deemed high rate for sexual abuse than any other state. Nationwide, Prison staff are the accused perpetrators in half of all reports of sexual abuse in prisons and jails, according to the latest Justice Department survey. That's big. It broadly defines any sexual contact from unwanted touching to a forced romantic relationship to actual rape. 
Now, accountability dwindles even further because it's real tough for the inmate to prove this, this sex abuse. Guards, nurses, and other prison staff have almost complete control over the lives of people who are incarcerated. The power dynamic has led to state and federal laws that identify any sexual contact, regardless of consent, uh, as criminal. Now, such protections for inmates are relatively recent. Uh, changes began back in 1996 when a fed-up prosecutor named Gina DeBottis lobbied the legislature to enact these new laws. At the time, she was prosecuting David Taylor, an employee at the Murray Unit, a woman's prison in Gatesville, Texas, who was charged with using threats to force multiple female prisoners to perform sex acts on him. So I guess he picked on the wrong woman here, so he, th- that's how this thing started. Now, the women had to go in and ask him about their parole, and that's when he would proposition them, Debata says. He would tell them, I know where you live. I can blow up your kids. And it scared those women to death, so they were willing to do anything. No other woman came at the time, but Taylor claimed that they initiated it, that they wanted it. According to the Associated Press trial, he faced up to 20 years in prison, but the jury found him not guilty. Despite this evolution policy, sexual abuse by staff continues. Now, folks, I, I'm just about done reading this thing. I do have to say a thing when it comes to men and women. It does say that women were the per- perpetrators in two out of three substantial sexual misconduct cases in Texas. And this bears true with the other articles that we've read throughout the years for you folks. It usually is women who, who do this. According to the state's PREA reports, at least part of this can be attributed to sheer numbers. Of course, the men make up most of the prisoners. Now, Celeste Borland was one of those officers. Borland's sexual relationship with Sean, who was incarcerated at the Clements Unit in Texas, unraveled when prison officials found a love letter in her car in 2010. You mean the world to me, begins the note from Sean. But the tone quickly changes as Sean accuses Borland of involvement with another inmate. He concludes his note with a request for $500 and says, You mean the world to me? And he wants her to tuck in a maxi pad into his note and signs it, Your husband. Now, this sounds like twisted stuff, but we're talking about a prison here, folks. Now, Borland said in a recent interview that Sean had me in his web and under his control, despite the fact that she was the keeper and he was the kept. It's often hard to see incarcerated men as victims in these situations, said Mark Edwards from the Special Prosecution Unit. And it talks about what is going on here. Uh, Also, female officers played a key role in crimes committed inside the Baltimore City Jail, where a leader of the Black Guerrilla Family Gang impregnated four female guards. That's right, four guards. And this is, of course, New York. Uh, court filings state that gang members targeted the women they thought could, they could manipulate in the prison, those with low self-esteem, insecurities, and certain physical attributes. Some of these officers aided in the smuggling operation run by the inmates at the jail by sneaking in drugs and cell phones. One woman said it felt like she was married to the mob. Next. Fifteen prison tattoos and their meanings. This one won't be as hard to do over the podcast as one might think. Well, jail staff staff can stay safer by knowing as much as they can about inmates, it said. And sometimes inmates make it easy to know exactly what they've been up to through the use of tattoos, or what they call prison ink. Now, there's a picture of a guy with a cobweb on his elbow. Cobweb is tattooed with a lot of broad kind of brush, and in the background there's some fading going on. Cobwebs typically represent a lengthy prison term. The symbolism is associated with spiders trapping prey or criminals trapped behind bars. This tattoo is commonly found on the elbows, signifying sitting around so long with your elbows on the table that a spider made a web on your elbow, though it can also be located on the neck. If you see a multicolored web, it's probably not a prison tattoo. Rarely do prison tattoo artists have use or access of colored inks. Now, the teardrop has been popularized recently by rappers. It's, if it's just an outline, it can symbolize what we call an attempt at murder. It can also mean that one of the inmate's friends were murdered and that they are seeking revenge. Those who are newbies behind bars with a teardrop tattoo will make a lot of enemies fast. Now, the next